something we are picking back up in the book of Acts. This has been an amazing study, hasn't it? Honestly, I think it's been the best study we've ever gone through as a church. If you're new to our church, we're in the middle of a study at the book of Acts, and uh, we believe that the Bible's best taught, taught through mes- uh, method, if I can talk this morning, called expository preaching. And what that means is we believe the Bible should be taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse, in order to understand what it means in our lives today. And so we're doing that through the book of Acts, a book that details the early days of the church, a book that introduces us to the primary mission of the church, the mission of leading people to Jesus Christ, a book of the Bible that also introduces us to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This is the method, the way through which God will work through us to take the gospel into the world, a book of the Bible, to be quite honest with you, that has the power and the potential to really transform and realign the direction of any church that is willing to embrace it. And I I know this to be true, because not only does the book of Acts teach this, but we are experiencing this as a church, aren't we? We're experiencing this on Wednesday nights as nearly almost 100 people are coming on Wednesday nights seeking God and asking Him to empower them. We're seeing it on Sunday morning. We saw it last Sunday. 35 people said, hey, we're all in and we're baptized. We're seeing it through the week as people are coming to faith in Jesus as we're reaching deeper and deeper and impacting our community more and more with the gospel. Listen, I have to be honest with you. I I didn't want to leave church last week. I I was so excited. It was amazing to to watch the Holy Spirit literally transforming lives in front of us. I don't know if you realize this, but we experienced the book of Acts last week. The Holy Spirit poured himself out on the service, and at the end of service, people responded, and they came forth. You saw miracles last week. We're experiencing the book of Acts. The question, though, is what now? Have you, thought, have you thought that this week? I mean, what, how do you move past a service like that? Where do you go from here? How do we keep moving forward? How, how do we help those that, that got baptized to, to stay on the right path? What, what are our next steps? Those are great questions. And the good news for us this morning is God words tell, God's Word tells us. Because as the first disciples and Christians came off of their high of the outpouring of the Spirit as they celebrated the baptism of 3,000 people who put their faith in Jesus, they took some critical next steps that you and I need to take as well. And really, they weren't next steps as much as they were practices. And when I say practices, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, those, those ongoing commitments or disciplines that are necessary in our lives to keep us moving in a direction or help us keep momentum towards something that we're traveling towards. For example, think of it in terms of like an NFL football team who has just won the Super Bowl. That's an amazing moment, right? Now, I know for some of you Chiefs fans, that's, that's hard to imagine because it's been 1970. Most of you weren't born then, but, but just trust me as a Broncos fan, it is an exciting moment. When your team wins a Super Bowl, just saying, (laughs) it's a moment of joy and celebration. So let me ask you this, after the Super Bowl win, how does that team move forward? What do they, what do they do? I mean, how do they, how do they move from that Super Bowl win to hopefully another Super Bowl win sometime in the future? Well, they do it by continuing to practice, right? They, they, they won the Super Bowl, but they keep on doing what it takes to keep on winning, right? So what do they do? Well, they, they keep up their conditioning, right? They, they keep going to the gym. They, they keep staying in shape. They, they keep showing up for practice. I mean, we got to run the plays. We got to fine tune our skills. They keep watching game film. Listen, we got to know what our opponents are up to. They continue to institute the practices that got them there in the first place. And what's true for an NFL Super Bowl team is true for the church as well. Because the fact is, last week, We had a spiritual Super Bowl win here at MCF. Last week, the enemy got his behind handed to him as 35 people proclaimed faith in Jesus and said, we're all in. I don't know about you, but I I wanted to high five people when I was walking out of service last week. And even through the week, I mean, I've just kind of been sitting in it and, and thinking about it. Even today, I'm a little bit jazzed up about it. We had a Super Bowl win last week. God showed up and the enemy was defeated. 
Just like a football team who has won the Super Bowl, it's okay to celebrate. Hey, it's okay to enjoy the moment. If we, cause if, but if we want to see another big win, listen, we got to keep practicing. We have to stay committed to what it takes to see more wins like that. Amen? So what are those key practices? What do we need to be committed to? What, what do we need to be disciplined about? Well, that's what Luke is going to show us this morning. And he's going to do that as he shows us three key practices of the early church that helped them keep move, help them keep moving the ball forward towards another big win. So here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to read through the passage this morning. Then we're going to we're going to identify. We're going to go back through and identify those key practices. And then as we close this morning, I want to give you some challenges this morning to take home with you. So let's get back to Acts as Luke now introduces us to these what we're going to call these post Super Bowl practices. Beginning in verse 42, 42, listen to what he says. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done, done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Luke says, following this big win, the early church instituted three major practices. Before we get to those practices, here's what I want you to first notice about what Luke has said about these practices. He says they were devoted to them. So let's start there. What, is, what does that mean? Well, the, the word devoted in the Greek comes from the word ame, and it's the idea of continuing to do something with intense effort despite the difficulty one might encounter. So when I think of this word, I think of, of that person who is devoted or committed to climbing and reaching maybe the peak of Mount Everest. Because in order for a person to do that, you have to be devoted, right? I mean, nobody just says, you know, they just, I think I might climb that mountain and reach that peak. You don't just kind of sort of do that with Mount Everest, do you? I mean, it's something that you have to be devoted to. It takes preparation. It takes dedication. It takes an on going commitment despite the challenges that you're going to face on the journey because if you watch any doc documentaries on people who climb mount everest what you're going to discover is there were moments when they wanted to quit moments when they wanted to stop moments when they wanted to turn back but because they were devoted to reaching the peak they they continued with this intense dedication despite the difficulties they were facing their devotion overcame the difficulty of the climb so what does this word then mean for us in this context? What is Luke trying to tell us about these practices up front? Two things. First, he's, right, he's trying to tell us, this, tell us that these are not easy practices. In other words, what, what these first disciples did to keep the ball moving forward took commitment. Something they had to be devoted to or, th or they just might quit doing it. So it took some continuing intentional effort on their part. These practices would at times be difficult. Second, it tells us that these are the practices it takes to reach the peak. In other words, there, there's not an easier way to reach the peak. There's not an easier path or path of left, less resistance. Listen, if you want to reach the peak, if you want to keep moving forward, you have to be devoted to these specific practices. So what are the practices? Well, if you're all in this morning, here are three practices that you need to be devoted to in order to keep moving forward. Number one. Luke writes, we have to be devoted to biblical instruction and teaching. He says they were devoted to the teaching of the apostles. Luke says, when they got together, they focused on teaching. Here's what I want you to notice first and foremost that they didn't focus on. They didn't focus on or devote themselves to keeping rituals. They didn't devote themselves to keeping traditions. 
He doesn't say they devoted themselves to a certain denomination or religious doctrine. Luke says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The question then is, what were the apostles teaching? Well, more than likely, it included what Jesus had taught them. Three years of understudy with Jesus. They knew a lot. They'd, they'd been exposed to a lot, so they're teaching that. In addition, it would, have, it would have involved teachings and instructions from the Old Testament that would have supported the plan of redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. You see, what we have to understand about the Bible is from Genesis to Revelation, it is a big, giant story of the redemption of mankind. And guess who the star of that story is? His name is Jesus. He's the promised Redeemer. He's the one that God sent to us to save us from our sins. So part of the apostles' teaching would have included an explanation of that redemption. And we know that to be true. Because right after Jesus' resurrection, he runs into two disciples. They don't recognize him in that moment. But listen to what he tell, Luke tells us in Luke 24. As Jesus interacts with them, here's what Jesus talks to them about. He says, "In beginning with Moses and all the prophets, the Old Testament, he interpreted to them all the scriptures concerning himself. Here's what he's saying. Luke says, from Genesis on, Jesus explained to them how the Bible, the scriptures, are all about him. We also see this kind of instruction through a disciple named Philip. We're going to get to Philip in Acts 8. And in this passage, an Ethiopian is reading from the book of Isaiah. He's not sure. He doesn't understand it. He asks Philip to explain it to him. Listen to what Philip says. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? about himself or about someone else. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Luke says, starting with a passage of scripture from the book of Isaiah, Philip is able to tell him about Jesus. All that to say, the apostles' teaching would have included the teachings of Jesus, along with the biblical support from the Old Testament of who Jesus is and what he came to do. So a good question would be, how does that apply to us? What it means for us is our teaching and instruction should come from the same source and be based on the same foundation. In other words, our understanding of salvation and spiritual growth should be based on the Bible and on a relationship with Christ. And herein lies the challenge for many in the church today because the truth is it's a lot easier to base our faith sometimes on a ritual or on a tradition or on, on being a member or a part of a certain church, right? Seems to be easier to do that. Why is that? Well, number one, because it is. The truth is rituals and traditions typically don't require a lot of effort, do they? For example, it doesn't take a lot of effort to read a prayer. It doesn't take a lot of effort to, to follow a, a ritualistic service format. It doesn't take a lot of effort to repeat a, a reading. It, it doesn't take a lot of effort to sit there for 45 minutes and go through effortless rituals, something we could do in our sleep. We just kind of show up, we put in our time, we go through the rituals, we go home, and we're good. Not a lot of work involved there. Second, rituals and traditions typically don't challenge us or grow us beyond a certain point. I mean, think about it. Because it's kind of effortless, it never really pushes us or creates a resistance in our life. It's like the person who goes to the gym and does the same exercise routine but never adds any weight or resistance to their exercise. I, I see this in the gym a lot, and please hear me. I'm glad people come to the gym. That's good. But a lot of, some people, they come in, it's just obvious. They haven't had any instruction. They're just kind of going through a routine. They just, they don't really add any weight. And then they, they just kind of leave. You know, they kind of wander around, do, 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 do this, do that. And they leave, and, and they never really see any change. They've never really, because they're not adding anything. They're not growing. They're not receiving any kind of instruction. They kind of just put in their time, go through the ritual, go through the routine, and leave. And then they wonder, why isn't my body? changing but if you're going to be all in you have to be willing to push past rituals and tradition and that's where the word of God comes in because, of, because the, the Bible 
takes us on an entirely different route. Because unlike rituals and traditions, the Word of God engages us, it challenges us, and it changes us. The two disciples that encountered Jesus, as Jesus explained the Scripture to them, listened to their response. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he what? Opened up the Scriptures to us. As Jesus explained the Word of God, it set their heart on fire, it challenged them, it ignited them, because that's what God's Word does. It engages us. It challenges us. And if you let it, it will change you. The writer of Hebrews says this, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The writer says, listen, God's word has the ability to penetrate your heart. It's able to weave its way into the hidden chambers of your soul. It has the ability to uncover you and move you and grow you. It does what no ritual or tradition could ever do. God's word confronts us with truth, forces us to consider change, and provides the Holy Spirit with an opportunity to transform us. And that's why here at MCF, we make teaching and preaching a priority. We understand its transformational power. And many of you know what I'm talking about. That's why some of you feel uncomfortable when it comes to the message. That's why Jill Frederick said in her testimony last week, she feels like she's getting her feet stomped on. That's, that's why some of you, you know, when, I, when I'm preaching, you, you think, he's talking to me. How did pastor know I was struggling with that? How did, how did he know that was true of me? Is he reading my mail? Did he, did he see my text messages? Has he been looking at my internet search history? I mean, that's why some of you even get angry during the message. You know, when I say something, you know, what? who does he think he is to tell me I can't sleep with her? Who does he think he is to tell me that my ritual is not important? Who does he think he is to, to say that to me? I don't know if I'm coming back here ever again. Can I just tell you, that's not me. I'm not the one challenging you. I'm not the one revealing anything to you I'm not the one making you angry it's the word of God remember sharper than any two edged sword meaning it has the ability to get inside of you it divides soul and spirit meaning it knows how to cut through your hidden layers It discerns the thoughts and intentions of your heart, meaning it has the ability to see what nobody else can see and what you may be hiding from others and maybe even from yourself. And it undoes us. And it, and it puts us through a workout that at times is painful and it stretches us and it tears us, but it makes us grow and it makes us better. Word of God can do what no ritual or tradition could ever do. And please hear me. I'm not saying that rituals and traditions aren't important. They are important. The truth is rituals and traditions are great reminders of what is important. Rituals and traditions remind us of who Jesus is. Communion reminds us of who Jesus is and what he did for us. But they don't have the power to change us. They don't have the power to get into your heart. The only thing that can do that is God's word. That's it. And that's why the first Christians made it a practice to study the scriptures. That's why we make it a practice to study the scriptures. Hey, if you you attend here very long, you're going to figure out real quick, we don't get fixated on rituals and traditions. Like the early church, we are devoted to learning God's word because at the the end of the day, that's what will change us. That's what will transform us. That's what the Holy Spirit is going to use to sharpen us and shape us more and more into the image of our Savior. Amen? See, if you want to be all in, you have to be devoted to God's Word. 
This leads us to a second practice. Number two, if you're going to be all in, we have to be devoted to Christian friendship or fellowship. Luke says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. A couple of things I want you to notice about what Luke says here. First, the word fellowship comes from the Greek word koinea. It's the idea of associations that involve close, mutual relations and involvement. In a way, you could think of it like a sports team. So, for example, an NFL football team consists of players who associate closely with one another for the mutual goal as they strive together to win, what? A Super Bowl, right? And so because they have this common goal, they, they make it a point to meet and practice daily. They make it a point to challenge one another and encourage one another. And because of their close association and their common goal, something begins to happen. They move from being co-players to friends to eventually family. In fact, one sports writer says this about football. He says, football is more than just a game. It's a bond, and it goes beyond the football field. He goes on to say football takes that unspoken bond to the next level when players become accountable for each other, challenging each other on and off the field. They ultimately become family. So if a winning football team functions in Koinea, don't you think the church should function in it as well? Second, I want you to notice they were breaking bread together. In other words, they were having dinner together. They were spending time with one another. Why would they do that? Because that's what families do. What, do you, what are you going to do for Thanksgiving and Christmas? Who are you, you going to sit down with at the table? You're going to sit down with who? Your family, right? You're going to share a meal with your family. You're going to share your lives with one another. What, 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 what Luke is saying here is, listen, the early disciples understood the importance of getting together, sharing their lives, and what better way than food, right? Food bridges, bridges all gaps. I mean, a good piece of pie bridges a friendship, does it not? You gotta love food. They got together. They ate together. They became family. Listen, the first Christians, they took relationships seriously. They made time for one another. They committed themselves to one another. And the truth is, if a church is going to, to function like a Super Bowl team, it has to be made up of a group of people who are devoted at the same level. Now, you might be thinking, okay, pastor, that, that sounds good. I like that idea. I like the idea of family. But why is that so important? Why, why do we need to make this such a focus? I would say for three reasons. Number one, Christian fellowship makes you a part of the church. Truth is, if, you, if you're a Christian, if you, you've put your faith in Christ, you now share a common goal with billions of other Christians, and in our context, at least 800 people who call this their church home. So if you're all in, this MCF is the team you're on. And the truth is, the, the, the church isn't a building. Just so you know, it's you. It's people. What made us a church this morning wasn't this structure. What made us a church this morning was you showing up here together with one another. This is the church. This is the church. And you being here in fellowship and present with other believers makes you a part of the team. The early church understood that. They understood if we're going, listen, if we're going to do what Jesus has asked us to do, we have to do it with like-minded people. People who have the same focus and the same goal. And if we're going to be on the team, then we have to begin by fellowshipping and being around our teammates. We've got to show up for practice. And to be honest, that's why church attendance is, is so important, because it creates this opportunity for you to come in and be around other people who share a mutual, a mutual goal, and then you can mutually benefit one another and support one another. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this. Listen to what he says. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. He says, let's think about how can we encourage one another? How can we better do what God has called us to do? Listen to what he says. By not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. He says, listen, if you, if you want to if you wanna be encouraged, if you want to do what God has called you to do, then make sure you meet together, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer of Hebrews says, listen, don't make it a habit of not going to church. See, the problem again for a lot of Christians is they see 
they see that they see a church service or sunday morning as an optional practice how many coaches in the room this morning know that practice is never optional we're having an optional practice over christmas okay see you at practice right see the problem again is we we see it as optional or we see something like life groups and getting together in a huddle as optional. Let me ask you something. What if a football team never got in a huddle during a game? Never communicated with another? Never, never put a plan together? Never, hey, can I help you with this? Hey, make sure you do this. What, what would happen if they just went out there and ran plays? You know, they, people who say, you know what, I don't think I need to be in a ministry. They never consider the importance of that. Listen, what, why wouldn't you want to serve alongside other brothers and sisters in Christ for a mutual goal, a mutual benefit to lead others to Him? It'd be like the quarterback who shows up and says, I don't need the rest of the team. I'll, I'll do it alone. Or the linebacker says, you know what, I'll take on the offense all by myself. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians do that. Instead of devoting themselves to Christian fellowship, you know, on a Sunday, they devote themselves to going to the lake. They devote themselves to, to sporting activities. They devote themselves to, you know, more sleep. They devote themselves to something else that at the time seems more important. And what they're missing out on is the fellowship that God wants them to have with other believers. And please hear me, I'm not saying if you miss a Sunday or two that you're a bad person. Or if you're not in a life group that you're not, you know, you're missing out. Or if you're not on a ministry team that you're not a part of the church. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying, though, is if you're not devoted to meeting and ministering with other believers on a consistent basis, it's going to be difficult for you to be a player on the team. Difficult for you to follow the vision. Difficult for you to feel a part of the church. Difficult for, for you to engage in what is happening. Honestly, difficult for you to be all in. Listen, I don't, I don't say this to make anybody feel bad because I know last week some of you had legitimate reasons for not being here. But if you weren't here last week and you could have been here, listen, you missed out on one of the most exciting services our church has ever had. Last week, we experienced a supernatural move of God. And that doesn't mean you're a bad person or, or not a Christian for not being here. But what I hope it reminds you of is if you want to be a part of what God is doing, you have to be present. So listen, I don't know about you. I don't want to be the person that hears about what God is doing. Hey, did you hear what happened at church? No, no what happened? Oh, you had to have been there. It was amazing. I don't want to be that person, do you? I, I don't want to hear about what God is doing. I want to be right in the middle of what God is doing. And to be in the middle of what God is doing, you have to be present. Christian fellowship, church attendance, gives us the opportunity to be present and to be a part with other believers in what God is doing through our church. Number two, Christian fellowship guards us against harmful relationships. I once, I once heard a quote, the, the guy that said this, he said, show me who your friends are, and I'll show you what your future will be. And what that person is saying is the friendships you invest in will largely determine the kind of person you become. And that's true. In fact, the Bible says that. Listen to what Solomon says, Proverbs 13. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. Solomon says, listen, you want to you be wise, you want to make good decisions, you, know, you want to become a person that's going in the right direction, then make sure you surround yourself with the right people, because if you don't, you're going to suffer harm. And again, that's what Christian fellowship is all about. It surrounds us with people who are not only on the same path, but, God, that, but, but people that God has put there to help you stay on the path. To be honest, again, this is where I see a lot of Christians go off the tracks as they surround themselves with the wrong people. And you might say, well, Pastor, how do I know if I've surrounded myself with the wrong people? Ask, your, ask yourself this question. Are the friendships you're devoted to right now helping you to grow spiritually? Ask yourself that question. Are the people I'm devoting my time to, spending time with, and when I say friendships, I'm talking about the people you get counsel from. I'm talking about the people you invite to your home, that you go out on the weekends with. I'm talking about the people that you share intimate details of your life with. Are those people leading you further away from Jesus or closer to him? Ask yourself that question, and you'll be on the way to discovering if you have the right kind of friendships. 
Because the truth is, your friendships are either leading you towards Jesus or away from Jesus. They're either leading you to be all in or all out. One or the other. Listen to what Solomon says happens when you choose the wrong friends. Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Solomon says, listen, here's your problem. When you choose the wrong friendships, you end up going in the wrong direction. And he says, if you're going to be friends with an angry person, get ready. You're going to become an angry person. The Apostle Paul says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Paul says, listen, the people you hang out with have an effect on you. So if you're all in, if you're going to follow Jesus, then it would probably be a good idea that you surround yourself with other people that say they're all in as well. In fact, the Bible says you should. Listen to what Paul says. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Bialah? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Paul says, listen, it's a bad idea for you to get in close association and relationship with a non-believer. Paul says it's like, it's like trying to bring light and darkness together. It just doesn't work. Now, when I say that, some of you are like, well, maybe, the, Pastor, that almost sounds kind of like we're exclusive or we're saying that we're better than other people. Listen, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that you can't be a friend or friendly to a non-believer. That's the only way you're probably going to reach them. What I'm saying is they can't be your closest friends. You can't have koinonia relationships with them because if you're all in and they're not, those two won't work together because being all in means you're no longer living for this world but the next to be all in means you're not living for yourself any longer, you're living for him. To be all in means you no longer share the same values that the world shares. Now that you're all in, friendship with the world is going to be very difficult. In fact, Jesus warns us. He says, because of him, because you're all in, you will be hated for my name's sake. Jesus says, listen, if you're all in for me, get ready, people are going to hate you. You see, now that you're all in, the friendships that you've had in the world are going to become impossible friendships because your values and your morals and your beliefs and your worldview and your passions and your desires have all changed. They're now the opposite of the world's, and the world isn't going to tolerate your change. The truth is, if you really want to be all in, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about defriending anybody. They're going to defriend you. Because in their minds, now that you're all in with Jesus, you're all out with them. They don't want to be a part of that. Light can't dwell with darkness. And I would say this is the hardest part for somebody that's all in who has put their faith in Jesus. It's hard to leave the old life because when the old you dies, old friendships typically die with it. Again, a great reason to attend church join a life group or be on a ministry team because this is the place where now your new friendships develop. Friendships that help lead you closer to Jesus. Friendships that keep you on the path. Friendships that don't lead you further away. One further, one more reason Christian fellowship is important. Number three, Christian fellowship protects us from the enemy. Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Truth is, now that you're all in, the enemy is going to try and take you out. Because he saw what happened last Sunday. He saw you get in the tank. He saw you cheering. He said, oh yeah? Let's see if you cheer when I do this. Let's see if you cheer when I try to take you out. Let's see how excited you are now, Mr. All-In Jesus Freak. I'm just telling you, get ready because the enemy doesn't like what is happening. Again, why Christian fellowship is so important. Because without Christian fellowship, you are left to fight the enemy on your own. Think of it like this. Have you ever seen one of those documentaries on African lions? It's interesting is they sh they'll like show you in the documentary how a lion hunts. You know, wanna, you want to know when it's one of the lion's strategy is to get its prey what? Alone. 
to get some poor little gazelle away from the herd so that it can take it out. Because if the gazelle is with the herd, it's a lot harder for the, the lion to get to it. The same is true for you and me. He is a lion, and he is looking for someone to devour. And I'm just telling you, if you don't think you need the church, or you're a couple that thinks you don't have to be in church, you are putting yourself in a situation for the enemy to devour you. You are making it easy, easy, easy for him to take you out. But if you're part of a church, you have friends in the church, then you can know it'll be a lot harder for him to get to you. It's interesting, as we go through the book of Acts, we're one chapter away, chapter three, persecution begins. The enemy's not happy. 3,000 people just got saved. He's gonna do something about that. And the persecution begins. What's interesting, though, is the persecution begins. I, I wanna just jump ahead to chapter four. I want you to see how the early Christians dealt with the persecution. Chapter four, when they were released, because they were imprisoned, they went to their friends. Who are their friends? The church, right? And reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So after being threatened not to preach the gospel anymore, notice who Peter and John go to. They go to their friends. They go to their church family. And in doing so, they are encouraged and they are supported. Listen, if you want to be all in, you have to be all in with the people who share your faith. This leads us to our final practice. If you want to be all in, number three, we have to be devoted to prayer. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Luke says the first disciples were devoted to praying together. See, they understood where the source of their strength came from. They, they understood in order to keep moving forward, we have to keep going back to the source of the power. In fact, we, as, we, as we look at ch chapter 4, because of, because of the threats, as they go back to their friends, as they tell them what happened, here's what's very interesting. Not only do they just kind of relay to them what has happened to them and get encouragement, but they pray. Acts 4, and when they had prayed... The place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Luke says, listen, after praying together, God refilled them with his spirit. Here's the deal, church. In order to keep moving forward, we have to keep getting refilled. We have to keep going back to the source of our empowerment. See, again, the problem for a lot of Christians is they, th it's just, they think it's like this one-time fill-up. Well, I said the prayer, you know, I was at that service, I got in the tank, that's great, but you can't stop there. It's a continuing filling as you continue to be filled by His Spirit. And prayer is the conduit for that empowerment. Think of it like this, what do you do when your car needs fuel? Well, you go to the gas station, Right? And you put the hose, right, in your tank so you can put fuel back in your car so you can keep moving forward down the road. It's the same in your faith journey. Listen, we can't keep going forward without getting refueled. We need fuel. So what do we do? We go to the gas station. We go to God. We put the hose in the tank. We pray, and he fills us with his Spirit. So if we're going to move forward, we have to be committed to going to the source of our power, to God, and continually asking Him and praying, God, fill us with your Spirit. I'm going to be honest with you. Last Sunday wasn't the result of great preaching. It wasn't. I, I was... I w if you were to ask me before church, I would have told you this would probably be the worst sermon I ever preach. Because I felt that way. And it wasn't the result of great worship. I mean, I love our worship. Let me tell you why last week happened. Last week happened because for four weeks prior to that, 80-some people were meeting here on a Wednesday night and praying that God would move. Praying that God would pour out His Spirit on our church asking God to empower us. And 
last Sunday, God responded. And he poured out his spirit on us in a powerful way. The week before that, Wednesday night, before last Sunday, we focused on prophecy in the prayer service. And if you're not familiar with prophecy, prophecy is simply, you know, us sharing something we feel like the Lord has told us. Be like me saying, I feel like the Lord wanted me to tell you this morning that he loves you. That's a good prophecy, isn't it? So during our service that Wednesday night, we allowed several people to just share one by one what they felt like the Lord was saying to our church. And as they shared, I wrote down what they said in the sequence that they said it. I want to read to you what that prophecy said. And then you tell me why last Sunday happened. As you pray to me, seek wisdom and understanding, and I will provide peace for you. Be confident and know that I'm going to heal you spiritually, physically, emotionally, as I fill and refill you with my spirit. My desire is that you would grow in unity as a family as you love and care for one another. And in doing so, I will pour my joy upon you as I heal, save, and transform you. For I am with you to give you strength and power for whatever you need. You are who I made you to be, so don't be discouraged. I can and will use you. I see your heart and your desire for me, and I will respond and empower you. So put me first, love one another, and I will bring these blessings. Be still and know that I am God. That came the Wednesday night before last Sunday. I'm just telling you, church, because we're praying God is working. We have to be devoted to prayer. That being the case, as I put the message together this week and I prayed about it, talked to our staff, we've decided to make the Wednesday night prayer meeting an ongoing meeting. Why would we want to stop doing something that God is obviously working through? Listen, I believe the more we pray, the more God is going to do. Now, here's the deal. We have to be devoted to this. Being devoted to a Wednesday night prayer meeting, that's, that's a big deal for all of us. You know, it's another message for me, just to be honest with you. Like, I have to be devoted to that. I have to be devoted to, to not only preparing Sunday to the, my, the best of my ability, but Wednesday night now as well. It, it's, you got to be devoted to it. Listen, it's a long day, right? You got a lot going on in your life. You know, you got kid stuff going on. You got sports stuff going on. So if you're going to be here on a Wednesday night, that's something you have to be devoted to, that you're going to have to push past other things. You're going to have to make an effort to be here. But I can just tell you, if you'll be devoted to it, God is going to show up. He's going to do something in you, and we're going to see more Super Bowl wins at MCF. I can promise you that. Now, here's the deal. Luke's now going to give us a preview of what, what will happen if we're devoted to these things. Because as the disciples devoted themselves to these three practices, listen to what happened. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. Luke says, listen, as the disciples devoted themselves to these practices, God began to work. He began to work through signs and wonders as miracles began to take place. We're going to start, we're going to see the first miracle take place in chapter 3. We, he, he began to move through the fellowship as people started to develop these friendships and this love for one another. People began to like give their lives to one another. Somebody needed groceries, somebody went to Walmart and bought them groceries. If somebody had a need, somebody provided it. People are even selling some of their worthless plastic possessions in order to help other people. Imagine that. Imagine that. They were also finding favor with the people. People outside the church were going, what is going on at that church? They're like, this is un." Believable. I didn't know church could be fun. I was talking to somebody this last week. I was telling them about, they don't go to church here. I was telling them about what happened at church. 
I could just see like deer in the headlight look on their face. And I said, well, shouldn't church be fun? Yeah. Shouldn't you walk out of church rejoicing at what God has done? Yeah, I guess so. Listen, I'm just telling you, people are watching. Lastly, as they did these practices, God did what he does best. He added people to the church. Listen, you and I, we can't save anybody. All we can do is be obedient to what he's called us to do. And if we'll do that, God will bring people to faith. I don't know about you, church, but I want to be that church. I want to have those kind of results. I want to see miracles. I want to see us become a family that takes care of one another. I want to be a beacon of hope and light in our community. I want to see more and more people come to faith in Jesus. I want what happened last Sunday to not be something that happens every once in a while, but that happens every Sunday. It's a natural occurrence at MCF. People get saved, and we celebrate new life. So here's what I would challenge you to do this week as we consider what God's word has said to us this morning. Number one, don't be devoted to rituals. Be devoted to God's word. Listen, some of you, you still struggle with this a little bit. Even last week, some of you, you wanted to get baptized, but you're still kind of holding on to that religious thinking, that, that tradition, that, 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 that religious thinking that you have, you know, kind of buried deep inside of you. Can I just challenge you to let go of that and to engage the truth of God's word and let the truth of God's word transform you and heal you and open you up in a way that you've never been open to him? I'm just telling you, if you'll let go of the rituals and traditions, it's not that they're not important, and you'll just embrace the truth, I can promise you, God's going to make a change in you. Number two, be more committed to church attendance. Here's what I hear Christians say all the time. It drives me nuts. If I ever ch I'll, I've challenged people on this, and they're like, well, pastor, you don't have to be a Christian to go to church. You ever heard anybody say that? Pastor, you don't have to be a Christian to go to church. You know what? You're right, you don't. That's true. You know what else is true? If you want to keep being a Christian, you have to go to church. See, the deal is, you're now, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're all in, you've now been designed to be a part of a body. And if you're going to try to function outside of the body, good luck. If you're going to decide to cut yourself off from the body, guess what? You're putting yourself in a position where you're going you're gonna to lose ground. You're putting yourself around wrong people. You're putting yourself in a place where the enemy now has easy pickings. The truth is, the less that you are part of the fellowship of believers, the more likely you are to drop off the map. Listen, I see this happen to people all the time. They miss a Sunday or two Sundays. Before you know it, they've missed a month. And, and it's very difficult at that point to reach people like that. And then they're sitting around wondering, why is my life falling apart? Why are things going so wrong? Why, why, why don't I have good people in my life? Guess what? Because you, you, you made it a habit of not going to church anymore. More. You quit surrounding yourself with the people that want to help you move forward. Can I challenge you this morning to be committed, not in a religious sense to church attendance, but with this understanding, I got to be in a place where other people like me want to help me move forward. And that can happen here. Finally, be at the Wednesday night prayer meeting. Seven to eight o'clock, we get done at eight, we don't drag it on. We, we, we get busy as soon as the clock hits seven. We, we, we seek God. We pray together. We, we focus on different things. And I'm just telling you, if we keep, to do that, we keep doing that, the momentum's going to continue. The Holy Spirit's going to continue to pour himself out. And God is going to continue to reach more and more people in our community. Amen? Again, church, I, I want to be more of that kind of church. I want more of last week, don't you? What now? What now? What now? We get devoted. Devoted to the teaching, devoted to fellowship, devoted to prayers. If we'll do that, God will show up, and he will add to his church. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going we're gonna to close out our service with one more song, one more worship song. Can I just encourage you this morning, just to lift your hands this morning, to give him praise, and let's continue to celebrate not only what God did last week, but what he's going to do moving forward. Amen?